Welcome to the Manic Metallic Podcast, where we respect fashion's past, analyze fashion's present, and get excited about fashion's future. I'm Liberty Gaiman, founder and creative principal of fashion media company Manic Metallic. Several times per week, I'll bring you episodes about exciting things happening in fashion, discussion about current issues facing the industry, and the places and people that have made the fashion industry great. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Instagram at the Manic Metallic Podcast and at Manic Metallic, both linked in our show notes. Now, let's get into today's episode. Welcome to the Manic Metallic Podcast. I'm Liberty, your host. For today's Who Is series, we're going to use it as an opportunity to celebrate the institution of Fashion Week, specifically New York Fashion Week. We're going to discuss the woman that made it all possible And by all, we mean the infrastructure of the modern-day fashion industry. We're going to talk about fashion publicist Eleanor Lambert. Eleanor Lambert, often called the Empress of 7th Avenue for her contributions to New York's fashion industry, was born on August 10, 1903, in Crawfordsville, Indiana, into a Presbyterian family. Not having much wealth growing up, she paid for her educational fees to attend the John Heron Art Institute, where she studied sculpture by cooking and making picnic baskets for boys at a local college. During this time, she met her first husband, architect Willis Connor, while also working independently for the Indianapolis Star and the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. They eloped and went to Illinois, where they were briefly students at the Art Institute of Chicago. Perhaps having gotten tired of being in Chicago, the young couple moved to New York in 1925 and started off living in an apartment in Astoria, Queens, while Eleanor worked two jobs. One of her jobs was at a fashion newsletter named Breadth of the Avenue, and the other was designing covers for book publicist Franklin Spear. She looked up her dad, Clay Lambert, while she was in the city, and actually managed to find him. As he had left the family when she was younger, this wasn't expected. He tried to promptly send her back to Crawfordsville, Indiana, on a train, because he didn't believe that New York was a great place for her to be. Spoiler alert, his efforts didn't work. Eleanor had a couple of jobs after this. She worked at a Manhattan ad agency and was the first press director of the Whitney Museum. Additionally, she helped to found the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, and the Art Dealers Association of America. We can see that already she had a large hand in developing the cultural landscape of New York City. But she wasn't done. She'd barely gotten started. As a publicist, she represented artists such as Salvador Dali, Isamu Noguchi, and Jackson Pollock. She took on her first fashion design client, Annette Simpson, in 1932, thus becoming the first ever fashion publicist. Eleanor believed that fashion is an art, so she decided to start focusing her energies primarily on fashion promotion. In building up the foundations of New York's fashion industry as we know it, she had a lot of help from one dominant event of the era, World War II. New York was able to ascend to the top of the fashion industry because Europe's industries were heavily affected by the war. With her first marriage having ended in divorce, Eleanor married her second husband, Seymour Brixen, a journalist and newspaper executive in 1936. He passed away in 1959. During the 1940s, she was brought on board to oversee the administration and publicity activities of the Cody Awards. Within the same period, she became the press director of the New York Dress Institute. She became the press director because department store owners at places like Saks Fifth Avenue, Henry Bendel, Bergdorf Goodman, and Lord and Taylor all collectively had a heart attack with the offensive ads that the Dress Institute themselves had put out. For example, there was one that they created where Martha Washington, very well dressed in the ad, of course, was tending to dying soldiers at Valley Forge. The department store owners thought that the Dress Institute needed a new public direction. I want to take a quick moment to tell you about Manic Metallic's recent product. Do you like fashion? Does it matter to you beyond just entertainment value? Well, Manic Metallic is a fashion media company that creates audio, written, and video content that supports our ethos that fashion is an art, discipline, and societal force for change. We recently published a fashion ebook titled Alternative Fashion Capitals, a survey of 20 cities of emerging thought leadership. In it, 
We detail 20 cities beyond just New York, Milan, London, and Paris that have thriving fashion scenes. And we dive deep into what they have to offer, including shopping districts, specific places to shop, brands, events, fashion organizations, fashion publications, and universities and colleges. These 20 cities have a lot to offer the world with regards to the fashion industry, and Manic Metallic is determined to share their stories. We'd love for you to consider purchasing this fashion ebook and for you to join our growing community via our website, social media, newsletter, and podcast. For more information on the ebook and where it can be purchased, please visit manicmetallic.com forward slash products. We look forward to hearing from you. Now back to the podcast. As a press director for the New York Dress Institute, she introduced the idea of Fashion Weeks, held twice a year in New York. The Dress Institute was tasked with naming their most talented designers, who were then subsequently called the Couture Group. And Eleanor insisted on being able to use designers' names in the creation of New York Fashion Press Week, the predecessor of New York Fashion Week. Having New York Press Week presented in a way that it was was a real advantage to journalists who benefited from being able to cover all of the shows in a more convenient time period. And I can tell you that as a journalist, that's a huge, huge help. I mean, if you look at how the fashion calendar can be these days, you've got designers showing one week and then you've got designers showing a couple of weeks later and it just gets really exhausting. So social events were mixed into New York Press Week as well, so that things didn't get too boring. Lambert also found that the International Best Dress List was involved in the creation of the Met Costume Institute, and she founded the Council of Fashion Designers of America, or the CFDA. The CFDA was founded in 1962, with Eleanor having created the CFDA charter to be based off of that of the American Institute of Architects, or the AIA. She remained an honorary member of the CFDA until her death. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Eleanor was asked by the U.S. Department of State to show American fashion for the first time in Russia, Germany, Italy, Australia, Japan, the U.K., and Switzerland. To give you an idea of what this entailed, I'm going to read off a quote from the Library of Congress detailing one of her events. I found this quote in an article written by writer Jennifer Harpster for the Library of Congress on January 19, 2012. Here's the quote. In order to help improve Soviet-American relations, she helped to produce the 1959 American National Exhibition Exposition in Moscow, sponsored by the U.S. State Department and Department of Commerce. On exhibit were home appliances, electronics, art, and of course, fashion. Those who know the history of the U.S. and Soviet relations might remember this event as the place where Nixon and Khrushchev argued about personal freedoms, better known as the Kitchen Debate. Her fashion show was a hit, and Ms. Lambert was invited back to the USSR and produced another fashion event in 1967, end quote. If you're a history junkie like myself, you get really excited at knowing that Eleanor Lambert had a hand in producing the event that gave way to the infamous kitchen debates. It's really neat, and it speaks to the wide reach that she had, both in fashion and in the country. Lambert campaigned to have fashion included as an art form in 1965, testifying for the Special Subcommittee on the Arts of the Committee on Labor and Public Welfare on October 31, 1963. The National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act of 1965 passed, and she was appointed by U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson to serve on the first ever National Council of the Arts, a division of the National Endowment of the Arts. On February 29, 1968, she produced the first fashion show at the White House, hosted by Lady Bird Johnson, the first lady at the time. In 1973, she produced a charity fashion show in Paris, whose purpose was to provide funds for the restoration of the Palace of Versailles. This fashion show became colloquially known as the Battle of Versailles. The fact that the chosen designers, Anne Klein, Oscar de la Renta, Bill Blass, Stephen Burroughs, and Halston, who all represented the Americans, stole the spotlight from the Parisian couture designers, went a long way toward enhancing the reputation of the American fashion industry. To honor her hard work in building American fashion, 
the CFDA awarded her with two awards. She received the CFDA Lifetime Achievement Award in 1988 and the CFDA Industry Tribute Award in 1993. In 2001, the CFDA created an award which the organization named after her, the Eleanor Lambert Award, whose purpose is honoring an individual who has made a quote-unquote unique contribution to the world of fashion and or deserves the industry's special recognition. A year before her death, she gifted the international best dress list to four of her favorite Vanity Fair editors in 2002. Eleanor Lambert passed away at age 100 at home on the Upper East Side. She worked until she died because she loved what she did. Eleanor had a real eye for talent, bringing numerous talents such as Oscar de la Renta and Stephen Burroughs into her fold and helping to boost their careers. Also, she was entirely devoted to the cause of boosting the American fashion industry's profile, and we all owe her a vast amount of gratitude for fighting the battles that she has fought for us. Think about it. Just stating that American fashion was important earned her the ire of editors for magazines such as Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, who were obsessed with Paris and its design talent at the expense of those here in the United States. They didn't want to hear about the talent that our designers have in America, but she made them listen. And eventually, these editors and journalists could no longer turn their heads because the talent shone too bright for them to do so. She's the reason why New York has a prestigious and well-respected fashion industry. Thank you, Eleanor. That's the end of our podcast. Tune in for our next episode, which will feature an in-depth article discussion. See you next time. Thanks for listening. If you got value out of today's episode, it'd mean a lot to me if you rate, review, and subscribe to the Manic Metallic Podcast. Be sure to tell all of your fashion inclined friends and co-workers about the podcast as well. This would really help us to spread our message about fashion being an art, discipline, and force for societal change. And don't forget to stay in touch with us by subscribing to the Manic Metallic newsletter and following us on Instagram. Feel free to reach out to us through either of those names. I'd love to hear from you. I'll link these all in the show notes. You're the best. See you next episode.